Have you ever been faced by a patient query and you didn't know the answer? What did you do next? You go online, either Google or up to date, and you spend hours trying to find the answer. What about using AI tools? What about using ChatGPT? Hmm, you don't trust them, right? You're afraid of hallucination and lack of references. But what if there are some tools that can help you find appropriate and right medical literature with references so you can double check? Today, we're going to talk about open evidence and proplexity. Hello everyone, my name is Rupen, I'm a hematology oncology physician, and I'm very interested in innovation in healthcare. And in today's video, we're going to review two tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis in finding the right appropriate medical literature that help me find answer to different queries that I face as a physician when seeing patients. Without further ado, let's jump in. If you go to their page, the first page is easy, simple user interface. They ask you to log in to ask questions. Then, if you go to the next tab, it's the API. They also offer API. For those who don't know what API is, it's a way of two softwares to talk together. For example, if I have Epic in my hospital and I want to integrate open evidence into Epic, maybe it can read the notes and come up with differential diagnosis, or I have it as a tab in Epic, so I use open evidence API. Then let's go to the about page. If you go to the about page, they have a very good accomplished team on their founding board. But also, when we scroll down, they have lots of advisors and they are clinicians, which is amazing. That's what I find also in lots of tech companies that try to innovate in this space, that they don't have any physicians on the founding team or on the advisory board. But here we have heavy representations of physicians so they understand what physicians are going through. Finally, if we go to their blog and we click on one of their articles, this is very interesting, I find. So they compared the performance of open evidence on the USMLE exam with other large language models like GPT-4 and ChatGPT and Anthropic and Google MedPalm, and they outperform other large language models. So for those who don't know what USMLE exam is, the USMLE exam is the United States Medical Licensing Exam. It's a two, three exams that actually three exams every physician have to pass in the United States before abling to practice medicine and before going to residency and further training like fellowship. The problem with performing large language model performance in USMLE, it does not mimic real life. USMLE questions, as you can see here, it's a text that have all the positive findings and the important findings that help a physician come up with the diagnosis and four or five multiple choices that a physician or a large language model can choose from. So there is a 25% probability at least that you will be right. And the text here contains all the positive findings. In real life, patient comes with much more than this. The electronic medical record have tons of information and sometimes we don't know what's positive or what's important and what is not. So that's why I don't think that comparing large language model performance on a USMLE exam really mimics its usability in real life. So now let's look at perplexity. Perplexity is an AI tool, but it is not specifically for healthcare, like open evidence. That being said, it has many uses, including it can help you finding recipes or buying even coffee machine. And they say that in their website. And they also provide a pro search where it can help you find better answer to your questions. Now you're gonna ask me why I use perplexity as a physician. Well, because it provides references without being asked to. And as physicians, we work with AI tools, we work with lab results, we work with imaging, and any test in healthcare has its own limitations and it can do mistakes, as AI can do. And that's why where the human effect comes in, we have to supervise the AI tool. And Proplexity provides me with references, which helps me feel more comfortable when I evaluate its answers. That's why I'm using Proplexity and I'm evaluating Perplexity and comparing Perplexity to open evidence. To test these tools, I'm going to use one question. Remember that this is not extensive test. It's only one question in cardiology and heart failure in medicine. Different specialties might have different outcome. So please give it a try on your own and see if you like open evidence or perplexity. For this question, there are multiple steps to figure out the answer. I'm presenting the AI tool with a patient with heart failure. And as you can see, I used acronyms and abbreviations because in a busy clinic, I don't have time to type heart failure. I'm just gonna type HF. So this is a patient with heart failure 
on appropriate guideline directed medical therapy they are already on four treatments and they have a normal kidney function so here as a physician or as an ai tool you have to consider the kidney function when considering the next step in the management of this patient because many of the treatment that we give in heart failure can interfere or require normal kidney function and i'm telling the ai tool that the ejection fraction is 37 percent for our listeners who don't have medical background this is considered low so i do have a space to optimize the treatment of this patient and according to the guidelines the next step will be adding circuitral valzartan because based on the paradigm heart failure trial patients with symptomatic heart failure and left ejection fraction less than 40 percent which is our patients uh, circuitral valzartan reduce mortality and heart failure hospitalization by 20 percent when compared only to ace inhibitor so that's where my answer is coming from and also based on this trial the guidelines were uh, created so i also used uh, other guidelines to back up my answer so simple question and this is where the, an the answer or the reference should come from of course there are other references you can talk about heart failure guideline directed medical therapy so this is the question pasted here and before going to asking for an answer here they have this button that you can choose you want guidelines and standard of care or you want clinical evidence so you can choose what type of references you want for the ease of this video and just to make it straight simple forward and as a physician busy in the clinic i'm not going to think about this i'm just going to click on all and this is the query give me the answer three two one let's go okay so it's analyzing it it was really fast um similar to gpt4 i would say um and it's here uh, they are telling you that for the management of patient with heart failure reduced ejection fraction so first it's summarizing the query um based on the then they are telling you it based on the american heart association american college of cardiology and heart failure society of america recommended considering replacement of an ace inhibitor or arb with angiotensin receptor Neprilysine inhibitor, which is my answer. That's what I'm looking for. And here they are giving you it, it. It is giving you the reference. And if you scroll down a bit, so this answer is coming from this guidelines, and also other papers. And here it also critiques the paper. So this is a guideline. And then if you click on show details, uh, it's telling you that it's coming from a top journal. And this is it looks like a review article coming from the Lancet and telling you this is highly relevant. Also, it's coming from a top journal. And also, they are using the Canadian Cardiovascular Society um, and the Canadian Heart Failure Society guidelines, um, which is like, that's what I'm looking for. In my answer, uh, as you remember, like I was looking for the guidelines and also I'm, I was quoting the Paradigm Heart Failure trial. It did not mention trial, but that's fine. Like it, because the guidelines are synthesized by the uh, trial itself, right? So I have my answer with references, which is correct and accurate answer. Um, and here they are, it is telling you which guidelines it's used. And it is telling you that the best next step is to switch to ARNI. But doesn't only tell you that, it mentions an important point. It is important to note that when initiating an ARNI, there should be a washout period 36 hours after stopping ACE, which is very important. Um, I didn't mention that in my required answer, but it mentioned it. It might not come to me sometimes if I'm practicing in a busy clinic and I'm seeing patients, I might forget if I haven't read this for a while. So it's monitor, it's it's mentioning that there should be a washout period. And beyond that, also it mentions that you have to monitor for the side effects, hypotension, renal function, electrolytes. And usually when we start those patients and this type of treatment, we will send like kidney function a couple of weeks or three weeks. It depends on the practice, what the physician do. We're going to monitor the electrolytes. So it's not only giving you the answer and the references. Also, it's telling you what to monitor for, which I really love. Great answer, open evidence. Now let's go to perplexity. I will put the same question. But I have to warn you, I haven't been impressed with the clinical reasoning of perplexity. That being said, I still use it. It helps me to find answer to questions that I come with not only it provides references but also it provides images as you will see so if i put the question here i have to change two things one i want to focus to be on academia so here you have to choose academic because i don't really care uh, what's going on on other places i'm not gonna uh, take answer from reddit or i don't want answers coming from um, i don't want it to rewrite or help me to generate text so i want an answer coming from academic papers and the other thing i want to switch it to pro so with the free version of perplexity they allow you to have five searches query using the pro version per day okay so let's jump in three two one click and so it's 
analyzing. Now it's asking me what is the main concern or goal for patient treatment. I will say symptom management and uh, improving heart failure and preventing hospitalization. Okay, so that's my focus. My focus is only on heart failure. I will send this. Let's see what it's going to say. Searching the web. Found 24 sources. It's taking some time, but it's okay. It's still fast. Now it's telling me that the treatment should focus on several strategies. Okay, so first is optimizing current therapies. Ensure that the patient's optimal doses of medications as per the latest guidelines. It can include that the patient doses of carbidolol, spironolactone are maximized based on the patient tolerance. Okay, that's true partially. For lisinopril, ensure the patient is indeed on the maximum. Well, I told you that the patient is already indeed on the maximum tolerance dose. Um, as ACE and play a crucial role, and then it's giving me other options. So it gave me other options. One of them is correct. Um, now it's giving me Ivabrodine. So it's an, another answer that it was not something that I'm looking for, but it is still it's part of the management of heart failure. Um, it's telling me I can use Ivabrodine if the patient's heart rate is above 70. That's right, because Ivabrodine causes bradycardia despite optimal beta blocker. But again, it's not the best next step here because it does not reduce mortality. ARNI reduces mortality. Consider switching from ACMR to ARNI. This patient is not already on class of medication. ARNI have shown to be superior to ACMR alone in reducing the risk of death and hospitalization. And a plenorm, it's another MRA. So my the answer that I was looking for is ARNI. Uh, those are like, help me to think further ahead. If, okay, so after ARNI, what can I do? But that being said, it's still a good answer. And the most important thing that is important for me as a physician is there are references. If I click on the reference, it will take me to the 2022 update of the 2019 heart failure guidelines. And then if you click here on via view via publisher, it will take you to this page. So you can read through article and decide if this is accurate answer for you. But that being said, let's go back to perplexity and open evidence and compare the way that display references and which one is better for me as a physician to look at the references uh, in my fast paced clinic. Going back to open evidence, let's review the references and how it is displayed. Several things I like about the references. One, there are no tons of references. There are three. So it's concise answer, short answer. And then you don't need to open a new tab. So you can click on show details and it tells you where it got its answer from, specifically from the reference and also that it critiques references. It tells you whether it's coming from top journal or it's highly relevant and whether it's a new publication. Then you can scroll down a bit and that it can give you the opportunity to ask follow-up question on the same case. And if you don't have follow-up question, it suggests for you follow-up questions to ask. And it might make you think about things that you didn't consider in the first place. For example, here they are asking you, do you want to ask open evidence about what is the role of sacubitril valsartan in heart failure or what are the potential side effects I should monitor for, which is a very valid question I can ask myself as a physician when I see this patient and I start them in the clinic on this type of treatment. That being said, the answers are mainly text-based. There is no image or a video I can look for. So it's unimodal, I would say. It's a text-based answer. Complexity, as you can see, the answer is a bit longer. However, it is more comprehensive. It did not only provide me with the answer that I'm looking for, and also provide me with other answers. If I'm working in a busy clinic, I want my, the main answer that I'm looking for. Those answers are not wrong, but however, they are not the best next step, and they can be considered further, let's say in a couple of months or three or four months, if the patient does not respond to ARNI. The nice thing, it also provided me with a novel insight. It provided me with things that maybe I might forget as a physician to discuss with my patient in the clinic. For example, the importance of exercise, adherence to medications, and adherence to diet. Eventually, it provides you with a summary about the entire answer, so it summarizes the answer. However, even in the summary, it did not provide me with single answer that I was looking for. Remember that this is one question. That being said, the number of references here are nine, and I can't read the references in this page. I have to click on them and open another page which is something I'm not a big fan of. The number of clicks per day for me as a physician is important. I want to minimize the number of clicks and read everything in one tab. The thing that perplexity have, and I didn't see in open evidence, is it can also do image search and it can also do video search. Let's say I want to learn more about heart failure guidelines. 
I can click on search images, search videos, and I can have beside the text videos and images. Eventually, finally here, if we scroll down, it also guides you to ask more questions. Maybe you want to understand or maybe you want to remind yourself what are the side effects of the medication that I will start the patient on. So you can click on the plus sign and it will take that search query and it will provide you with an answer. If you like this episode, please hit the like and subscribe button and try to share it with your friends and colleagues. This really helps me to grow the channel. If you have any questions or any tools you want me to review, please leave them in the comments below.